In Washington, D.C., a notorious drug gang threatens an entire neighborhood. Witnesses are intimidated or killed. Even as the police and the FBI build a case against the killers, the body count continues to climb. Drug sales skyrocket as a neighborhood becomes a virtual war zone. Now the FBI must find the key to destroying a deadly gang known throughout the city as the K Street Crew. In the 1990s, the war on drugs was in full swing. The front lines were often America's inner cities, where gangs used violence and murder to rule their empires. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When gang violence exploded in Washington, D.C., the Metro Police and the FBI fought back. Using high-tech surveillance and tough new laws, they set out to destroy the gangs from the inside out. Washington, D.C. In this city of monuments and museums lies the heart of American justice. The Supreme Court, the Department of Justice, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. But even our nation's capital is not immune to crime. March 22, 1991. 20-year-old Wendy York returns home after running errands. Teresa! She shares an apartment with her cousins, Tarita and Teresa Lucas. Teresa is in the living room, lying on the couch. Her face is covered with blood. Oh, my God! Wendy runs from the apartment and calls 911. An emergency dispatcher directs units to the scene. DC Metro Police arrive at the apartment within minutes. Teresa Lucas has been shot through the head. In a back bedroom, they find another body and a child. The second victim is Teresa's sister, Tarita. She has also been shot in the head. Her child is unharmed. Police discover another baby, terrified, but also unharmed. It's Teresa's child. It seems both children have been alone with the bodies for hours. A short time later, the victim's mother arrives at the apartment. Renee Brown finds the building surrounded by police. My mind was racing, and I was trying to get in. The police were holding me back. They said, you can't get in. I said, this is my house. I have to go in. That was the most horrific day of my life. I will never forget it. They were very devoted and dedicated mothers. They loved their kids, and, um, and they didn't deserve to die. Crime scene investigators process the apartment. They find no signs of forced entry. Nothing in the apartment appears to be disturbed. No valuables have been taken. There is nothing that suggests a motive for the brutal slaying. Detectives suspect the victims knew their killer. Detectives ask Renee Brown to check the apartment. The grieving mother is willing to do anything she can to help. Renee notices something missing from Teresa's bedroom. The first thing I noticed was that a poster-sized picture that was there the previous night had disappeared from off the wall. A frame is found, 
but a photo of Teresa's boyfriend, Sam Carson, is gone. And I told the detective then, I said, I wonder where that picture is. And we looked in the trash in the back, and it was nowhere in the trash. So I said, whoever has that picture is the murderer. Police contact hey, Sam. Sam Carson to ask him a few questions. He denies being in the apartment the night the two women were murdered. Uh, do you know that your girlfriend was killed last night? Although Carson is a likely suspect, police have no physical evidence to tie him to the murders. Detectives interview people in the neighborhood. Although gunshots were fired in the Lucas apartment, Neighbors claim they heard nothing. Not sure about that. I don't, I don't, I don't Did you happen to know the women? No, no. I don't, Two don't young know. women have died, I don't know so not and yet I'm nobody not. is willing to talk about it. The double homicide catches the attention of law enforcement across the district, including the FBI. Special Agent Vince Lissy is shocked by the brutality of the crime. Photos Agent Lissy often works undercover and must protect his identity. It was horrific. The police had very few leads to go on. Uh, they struggled and struggled with the investigation for some time, but there were no real witnesses to it. Without a witness, police cannot identify a suspect. Without a motive, they cannot catch the Lucas girl's killer. And without evidence, the double homicide will become a statistic Yet another unsolved murder in a city plagued with violence. The epicenter of that violence is Greenleaf Gardens, a housing project on K Street. The drug trade has reduced the neighborhood to chaos, according to Detective Steve Kirshner. Crack cocaine hit the city hard in 85, 86. Along with that came a lot of violence. The homicide rate went sky high. I believe it started out mostly from jealousy of who was making the most money. There were kidnappings, assaults. It just led to a very violent area. Buyers, many of them from the suburbs, made the dealers on K Street rich. The area provided few economic opportunities, so the lure of easy money proved a powerful recruiting tool. It was a huge money maker for him. And it was pretty hard to tell a 14 or 15 year old kid, hey listen, go to school, do all the right things, whenever they can go out on the street, sell crack and make $1,000 a day. They could buy all the things that they didn't have before uh, because they live in an impoverished home. With millions of dollars in easy profits at stake, competition between dealers grew fierce. Streets became borders as gangs battled over sales turf. The neighborhood was a powder keg, according to Metro Homicide Detective Tony Brigadini. The area was deadly. Numbers that we have compiled over the years of the investigation showed that this was probably one of the most deadly areas in the District of Columbia. It's very close to some of the government buildings in Southwest Washington, which was interesting in that there's an incredible amount of crime going on in a small area so close to a downtown business district. The FBI and DC Metro Police form the Safe Streets Task Force. Their job is to clean up a neighborhood that has become a war zone. Agents canvassed the streets, looking for information on the gangs. Residents are too afraid to talk, or even be seen speaking with investigators. If you walk up to somebody's door and you knock on their door and ask to speak to them, in about three minutes, everybody in that neighborhood is gonna know that the police are there. Frustrated by the lack of cooperation, agents try a different approach. 
Sometimes we follow people to work. We try to get them away from a neighborhood. We try to do whatever we can so that the people in the neighborhood don't know they're witnesses. Slowly, the residents open up. They talk about drug dealers who have taken over the neighborhood. The K Street crew. The gang is led by Vincent Hill, a ruthless sociopath who seems to thrive on violence. If somebody came up and irritated him for any reason whatsoever, he had no problem grabbing a baseball bat, a hammer, anything he could, and hit them with it. Hill's money and his brutality make him the most powerful man in the neighborhood, according to Metro detective Neil Trugman. He compared himself to a big-time mob figure. There, there was no fear. According to FBI sources, Vincent Hill runs the K Street crew with an iron fist. Still, gang members respect him. Vincent Hill had a reputation for being a bully, but at the same time, others looked up to him because they saw that he had money, he had nice clothes, uh, he had fancy cars. While he's manipulating them into selling drugs, they would see him beat somebody up for not giving him enough money. So all of these things kind of led the others to look to him as somebody that you didn't want to mess with, you didn't want to challenge, but at the same time, he was a way that they could make money. The distribution of crack cocaine carries severe penalties. A conviction could get Vincent Hill and his crew off the streets permanently. I think they're start a lot of marijuana. Agents launch an investigation into the gang's crack dealing. But Hill's group is already one step ahead. Before the FBI can bust the K Street crew on cocaine charges, the gang suddenly shifts to selling marijuana. They realized when they were selling crack cocaine, you're looking at stiff time. Selling marijuana was a misdemeanor. More than likely, you wouldn't get any time for it. The demand is huge. Buyers pour in from the suburbs. The gang maintains its profits, minimizing the risk of jail time. It just took off like a rocket. Everybody was making money. Uh, you know, people were making three, four, five thousand dollars a day just by selling marijuana. Thwarted by the gang's move, the task force regroups as the dealers grow even bolder. Uh, I would drive by in unmarked cars, and they would hold bags of marijuana up, three for 20, three for 20. And then when they finally got close enough to realize they were a cop, they would run. The dealers simply abandon their stashes until the cops leave. Minutes later, the dealers return to the exact same spot with a new stash and set up shop again. As business expands, the violence escalates, sometimes involving innocent victims. On August 29, 1992, Travis Ross and two friends are mistaken for rival drug dealers. is killed instantly. Both of his friends are critically wounded. Police interview the survivors. They say they have no idea who shot them or why. Their reluctance to answer questions is understandable. Police believe the K Street crew has already murdered a dozen people who cooperated with authorities. What they don't know is how the gang is able to identify these potential witnesses. In 1995, Bruce Spencer is shot five times at point-blank range by a K Street crew member. Somehow he survives. He is willing to identify the man who shot him. The task force immediately places Spencer in protective custody. 
He's registered at a DC hospital under the name John Doe. While Spencer recuperates, Agent Lissy and other investigators scour Greenleaf Gardens looking for the men who tried to kill him. On K Street, Agent Lissy and Detective Trugman find themselves face to face with Vincent Hill, the gang's notorious leader. He said, look, all your witnesses are gonna die, every one. Even your buddy who's in the hospital under the name John Doe in room, and he told me exactly what room it was. And uh, I shook my head as if I didn't know what he's talking about, but I knew exactly who he was talking about. They wanted to let us know that it was their business to locate witnesses and silence them. Investigators are even more determined to protect their witness. But word of Hill's threat reaches Spencer. Fearing for his life, the witness refuses to help investigators. I'm through, man. I'm through. Everything's working out. Come on, it's not. The task force is frustrated, having lost another battle in their war against the K Street crew. In the 1990s, Greenleaf Gardens in the southwest section of Washington, D.C., is a neighborhood under siege. A gang calling itself the K Street Crew has claimed the housing project as its base of operations and turned it into a killing zone. Metro Police, working closely with the FBI, struggle to link the gang to a rash of killings. Investigators know it will take more than individual murder convictions to stop the widespread violence. They need a strategy that will take down the entire gang. The Joint Task Force decides to use RICO, a federal racketeering statute, that will allow them to prosecute the K Street crew as a single, corrupt organization that sells drugs and commits murder to protect their interests. Homicide detectives re-examine dozens of cold cases, cases that were once attributed to the random violence of the projects. They search for anything that will link the K Street crew to murder, according to Detective Tony Brigadini. Some of the cases that we were investigating were eight years old, 10 years old. We would have to go back and research case jackets, try to find evidence that had been collected eight or 10 years earlier, try to locate crime scene photographs, things of that nature. Yeah, there, here it is. See this car, is that the same car? So in trying to build a strong case, we were dealing with, with very little information. In the meantime, agents launch a covert surveillance operation to gather evidence on the gang's growing drug business. Special Agent Vince Lissy. We wanted to show the conspiratorial nature of these guys, how they operated on the street, how they took turns selling drugs, who supplied who. And we thought that if we could have undercovers introduced to the group, that we could accomplish this. FBI agents set up a stakeout in an apartment overlooking K Street. The landlord offers it to them free of charge. Like most of the residents of Greenleaf Gardens, he's sick of the drugs and the violence. We got some uh, camera equipment, video, and still photos, and we would sit up there and watch them and try to get uh, the people on K Street's patterns down. We would see Vincent Hill out there and see how he operated. Investigators watch the area for weeks. Once they've established the gang's patterns, they develop a plan. Most of the drug transactions on K Street are conducted with buyers in cars. To get closer to the dealers, they'll need a vehicle. We decided the best approach was to use a pickup truck. We got the oldest, dirtiest pickup truck the FBI had. Uh, we bought some toolboxes and put toolboxes on the back of the truck to make it look like a construction truck. The truck is rigged with surveillance cameras and microphones. Two Metro investigators, Joe Abdallah and 
Jim Scheider are recruited from another precinct. As outsiders, they will not be recognized by gang members. They will pose as construction workers to make drug buys. Metro investigator Joe Abdallah. So if me and Jimmy had a prearranged, if I was in any trouble or I felt my, my safety was in jeopardy, I was going to run for that truck, and depending on the situation, Jimmy was going to take off with me jumping in the back of that truck, or he would get out with his firearm. The main target of the surveillance operation is Vincent Hill. The undercover officers expect they will have to make several buys before they can make contact with the gang leader. Five cars carrying two-man teams form a perimeter around the neighborhood. They stand by on their radios, awaiting Lissy's orders. We had all this in place. We had the cars situated throughout the neighborhood. And we said, OK, let's go. Let's try it. Nobody moved until our As the officers attempt their first undercover buy, Jim Scheider knows he is heading into dangerous territory. As soon as we turned a corner, my heart started racing. We knew that uh, there was no turning back at that point. Abdallah and Scheider looked for a dealer, any dealer, to buy from. Then on a street corner, they spot Vincent Hill flanked by his lieutenants. The K Street crew is out in force. What y'all need? Can I get a couple bags? Dalla doesn't think twice. He gets out of the truck. And I'd asked if I could get two bags for 40, which meant two bags of marijuana, uh, which were $50, but if I could, I'd get them for $40 a piece. An individual to my left side ran to go get them from a stash, which was on a fence line. And Vincent Hill said, no, you'll take two for 50. I put the money down, and then I walked away. The surveillance team documents the entire transaction. They now have the leader of the K Street crew on videotape, personally selling marijuana to undercover officers. Joe bought from Vincent Hill the first time. And we said, wow, this is too easy. Within 30 seconds, the deal was done. Jim and Joe rolled back to the office, and we were just amazed. The task force has been prepared to wait weeks, even months, to make contact with Hill. But it happened in less than a minute. The FBI presses their advantage. Over the next six months, they continue to buy marijuana directly from Hill, gradually increasing the quantity. Each time, the sale is carefully photographed. He was there. He never touched the drugs. Through the undercover buys, investigators discover that Hill controls everything that happens on the block. This becomes clear when Abdallah and Scheider try to make a purchase from someone other than Hill. And we were getting ready to make a purchase. And there was someone hollering down the street. When we looked back, it was Vincent Hill. We went back down into the block, met with Vincent Hill and bought from him. And I think he had that kind of power in that block. For months, the buys go on like clockwork. Abdallah is doing more than making purchases. He's building a relationship. Slowly, he gains Hill's trust and tries to get information. I try to get any conversations I could from him. And there were times when I'd try and draw a conversation from him where he would say, look, if the police come in the block, I have a place to run to. You don't. So tell me what you need, let's get it over with. And there were also times when I had a conversation with him about setting up weight purchases, or you know, more than the $20 bag, what we would call wholesale quantities, like quarter pounds. Abdallah begins buying in bulk, moving from ounces to pounds. He tells Hill he is selling marijuana at the construction site where he works. There were occasions when he would actually front me drugs, which would mean he'd give them to me for free for payment at a later date. We had that kind of trust. And he even gave me good advice on when buying the weight, he would 
supply me with the smaller $20 bags. He gave me uh, packages of those at some points, and he would tell me how to juggle it or I mean break it down and sell it in the quantities to my friends, and he gave me helpful hints on how to do that. For six months, the operation runs smoothly. Then, a routine buy puts everyone on guard. Well, at one point when I made a buy from him, I got back into the truck and Jimmy was driving and I was in the passenger seat and Jimmy said, hey, he's, he's waving at you. And he was motioning like to roll the window down. So I rolled the window down and he said, hey, look, these guys over here, they're saying that your buddy's a police officer. He said, I know you're okay, but he said, those guys over there will kill you. Somebody tell me what's going on, police. Yo, I know y'all can't play me like that, right? And it, it, it threw us off a little bit and then when we started to leave, the guys that he was pointing to had like hoods over their faces and put their heads away from us. It does not appear to Abdallah and Scheider that Hill suspects they are cops. So they continue the operation. A week later, the two detectives pull into K Street. Vincent Hill is there. Hill was cold to me, he didn't want anything to do with me, he said he didn't know where they sold marijuana, he didn't know what I was talking about. And it was, it was very confusing, because even when he was angry and sold, he was just in a hurry. He said, what do you need? Hurry up and get out of here. But on this day, he's like, I don't have anything, I don't know what you're talking about, you can go somewhere else. Hill sends them to another dealer down the block. That night, Abdallah meets the dealer in an abandoned house. The officer prepares for a confrontation. The gentleman walked into a vacant house, called me in. Safe up here. The gentleman tried to give me like a sandwich baggie full of lawnmower clippings. It wasn't real marijuana. So it was that point, we knew something was wrong. Abdallah knows their cover is blown. With backup cars at least two minutes away, he slowly talks his way out of the building. The undercover operation is over. After six months of drug buys, the task force still does not have enough evidence to put Vincent Hill and his gang in prison once and for all. Had we charged him with the drug conspiracy alone, it might have gotten them 10 years, maybe five years. And what's even worse, they would have been held accountable for all the violent crimes they committed. So we still needed to investigate the murders and the robberies and the kidnappings and all the violent crimes that were associated with that group. Investigators still have a lot of work to do. In the meantime, the streets rage with violence. In Washington, D.C., a lengthy undercover operation has begun to produce results. Investigators have videotaped the infamous K Street crew selling drugs. But now, they must find evidence of the gang's more violent activities. In 1995, a brave young woman steps forward. So what would you like to Chrissy call? Gladden is 19 years old. You know, that you can share with her. As a single mother, she is worried about her neighborhood. Okay. We know you're scared. These are scary Chrissy people. tells police that Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are responsible for a drive-by shooting. She overheard Martin talking about it. Although she doesn't know the victim's name, her description of the crime leads investigators to an unsolved murder. Six months earlier, Travis Ross had been killed in a drive-by shooting near K Street. Two of his friends were critically wounded. Chrissy wants to testify against the gang. She knows they are the reason her neighborhood is so dangerous. Still, she's afraid. She tells investigators that if she speaks out against the K Street crew, they will kill her. 
Chrissy Gladden and two other women finally agree to testify, but only if the FBI places them in the witness protection program. Special Agent Vince Lissy. We finally convinced Chrissy as well as these other female witnesses that we would work with them. We would try to keep them safe and make sure nothing happened to them. We stressed upon them not to tell people where they lived, not to take people to their new apartments. Chrissy's cooperation pays off. Crew members Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are indicted for murder. All right, hold the slide up to your bicep. Lissy believes they have enough evidence to get a conviction. Even though one witness is recanted, two others, including Chrissy, are still willing to testify. It's not a big deal. The week before the trial of Jerome Martin, we're constantly re-interviewing witnesses, talking to them, getting them ready to testify. We want them to know what questions they're going to be asked if they take the stand to testify. And the week before, we had Christy in the U.S. Attorney's Office. We got her ready. She pretty much knew what was going to be expected of her. She wasn't an eyewitness to the murder, but she did fill in certain gaps. Four days before the start of the murder trial, Vince Lissy right. receives a call from right, one I'll of the witnesses. I'll set it up. She was frantic, okay. screaming, crying, uh, telling me they killed Christy, they killed Christy, Christy's dead and I couldn't believe it. And then whenever I realized what she was talking about, it was like somebody punched me in the stomach. Agent Lissy drives over to the Southwest District. At the crime scene, Metro Police tell him what happened. Get that mark right away. Call forensics. According to witnesses, Chrissy attended a party on 37th Street at the home of Antonio Knight's girlfriend. As she left the party, two gunmen appeared and opened fire. By the time police arrived, Chrissy was already dead. Not surprisingly, investigators are unable to find a single witness willing to identify Chrissy's killers. The message from the K Street crew is clear. Talking to the police is a death sentence. Chrissy thought that everything was fine. She trusted her friends. She trusted the people in that neighborhood. Thought she could go back there and nothing was going to happen. That was probably the worst I've ever felt in this job. It's hard. It's hard to keep going sometimes when that happens. Still, the task force pursues their case against Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight. The trial is a disaster. The case had lingered in the system so long in D.C., we said, we got to go. And we went forward with it, and we did the best we could. Some witnesses were just physically unable to testify. They were just distraught. Um, but, you know, we went forward and we lost. Jerome Martin and Antonio Knight are acquitted due to lack of evidence. To the K Street crew, witnesses like Chrissy Gladden are a minor inconvenience. It was really something to see these guys go free. And at that point, they won the battle. They were happy. They won the battle. And I told myself, I, you can't sit back and let them continue to win these battles. Chrissy Gladden's death and the acquittal of Martin and Knight are major blows to the investigation. The task force refuses to give up. Somehow, they will find a way to bring the K Street crew to justice. In Washington, D.C., the K Street crew is terrorizing a neighborhood with drugs and violence. Investigators spent months working with 19-year-old witness Chrissy Gladden, who agreed to testify against them. On October 5th, she was gunned down outside a party. Even without witnesses, Detective Steve Kirshner is determined to find her killers. We stayed on it 
trying to find a break in that case. And we did everything we could. We printed up flyers, uh, offered a reward. Uh, it, it really crushed the investigators uh, on the case, uh, especially Vince. It's horrible. It's just, you know, part of you says, what more can I do? That's it. You want to wave the white flag. But the other part of you says, wait a minute, I'm not going to give up. You know, I'm not going to give in to their ways of justice. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Less than a month later, the FBI and DC police get an unexpected break in the case. Robert Butchie Smith, a senior K Street crew member, is arrested for drug dealing. In an effort to get Smith to talk about the gang, the FBI tells him he faces federal racketeering charges. They're building a RICO case that will tie the gang's drug business to a series of murders. The tactic works. Smith finally agrees to talk. Smith reveals that the gang uses private investigators to identify people willing to testify against them. They also use the Freedom of Information Act to obtain court documents to target potential witnesses. Smith gives investigators leads on several unsolved kidnappings, shootings, and murders, according to Metro Detective Tony Brigadini. He had very specific, protected information of the crimes and the business dealings that the members of the K Street crew participated in. Smith specifically mentions a triple homicide that his nephew, William Sweeney, told him about. Sweeney, along with Sam Carson and James Montgomery, are fellow members of the K Street crew. Smith said Sweeney and Carson were in Las Vegas when Ryan Pierce, another drug dealer, won big at the tables. The two men decided to rob Pierce when he returned to DC. On November 17, 1996, Sweeney, Carson, and James Montgomery waited outside his home. Pierce arrived late that night, along with three friends. The K Street crew made their move. Where the money at, bro? What's up, man? What's this, man? Where the money at? No, where the money at? Get over here. Get over here. Get over here. Get over here. Pierce told the gunman he had already put his winnings in the bank. There was no cash in the house. Where is it? I'm asking one more time. Where is it at? Man, this is crazy, man. I don't got no money in, man. Wait, wait, wait. Sweeney killed both men. One woman tried to flee, but was shot to death. Another woman managed to hide until the killers left. Get out of here, my son. Get out of here. According to Butchie Smith, the K Street crew usually kills people in response to a threat. But Pierce's murder was different. This time, it was all about greed. My nephew, Sweeney. Investigators hope that Smith's inside information is the break they need to finally bring down the gang. At that point, then we knew, OK, now we can start to get the framework of an indictment ready so that we could go and start to prepare charges against these guys for crimes other than the drugs. Smith agrees to become an FBI informant in exchange for a reduced sentence. It's a risky decision. I'm dead. I'm done. If anyone finds out he's talking to authorities, Vincent Hill will have him killed. Technicians analyze a single fingerprint found on a screen door at the murder scene. It matches Sweeney's prints, corroborating Butchie's story. What also helped us was we got William Sweeney's uh, cellular telephone records. And uh, some of the people working the case began to go and investigate that. And they contacted the cell phone company and found out that the cell phone was used near the scene of the triple murder at the time of the murder. 
Investigators moved quickly to neutralize Sweeney. In April 1997, he is arrested on unrelated charges. While awaiting trial in jail, Sweeney receives a copy of his own arrest warrant from his attorney. An unnamed source is listed as an informant against him. Two months later, just when it looks like the task force is about to put an end to the gang's operation, Robert Butchie Smith is gunned down in broad daylight. The FBI informant has been shot a total of 13 times, mostly in the head. When Butchie got killed, it brought back all these uh, feelings and the memories, and you know, it's hard. It's hard to keep going sometimes when that happens. Much like Chrissy's murder, we, there were no leads. There were, although many people were out on the street and saw it that day, nobody would come forward, nobody talked. Butchie Smith's murder threatens to unravel the case against the K Street crew. Investigators have lost their only informant. The brutal killing scares away other potential witnesses. After Butchie's murder, we sat around looking at each other like, what do we do now? Where do we go from here? It really took a lot of the wind out of our sail. We ain't stopping. We had to figure out how we can continue with the investigation. Where were we going to go? We thought, OK, we can follow up with the leads Butchie gave us. But still, we needed somebody on the inside. And we no longer had Butchie to give it to us. We had to gather around and tell ourselves, we can't let this get us down. We can't stop. In 1997, the FBI's case against the notorious K Street crew was in trouble. The only informant had been murdered, gunned down in cold blood. Other potential witnesses are terrified they'll meet the same fate. Before he was killed, FBI informant Butchie Smith told investigators that James Montgomery was one of the men responsible for a triple homicide. Montgomery is arrested and brought in for questioning. Mr. Montgomery, interesting. You got like three Special Agent Vince Lissy pressures the suspect to talk about the triple homicide and the rest of the gang's crimes. Montgomery is already facing a long prison term for the murders. Anyone tell me about anything? In the end, he decides to cooperate. Montgomery admits his role in the triple homicide. He also confesses to seven murders, including that of cooperating witness Chrissy Gladden. Lissy presses for more leads on crimes committed by the gang. Montgomery reveals that crew member Sam Carson killed informant Butchie Smith. What else you know about Carson? Then he drops a bombshell. He told me, do you remember when the two girls got killed? And I asked him, which two girls? And he said, the ones back in the early 90s. I knew exactly what he meant. Montgomery is referring to the unsolved murders of Teresa and Tarita Lucas. And he began to tell me about it, and I just couldn't believe it. What do you want, Sam? I just want to come in and talk to you for one or two minutes. According to Montgomery, Sam Carson had stashed a bag of guns at the home of his girlfriend, Teresa Lucas. When he asked her to return the guns, Teresa claimed she didn't have them. She didn't want them around her children, so she threw them away. Can I use the bathroom real quick, please? Carson was furious. He decided to confront Teresa one final time. Carson hid his handgun in the bathroom. He tried to calm Teresa's fears by showing her he was unarmed. You know what this is about. I want my guns, Teresa. He began again to ask her, where's my gun? I need my gun. Where did you put them? No, nobody has them. Sam, I just threw them out. I want them right now. No, Sam, there are children in the house. 
I want my and gun. she gave him an answer that wasn't satisfactory. All right, you want me to go? Just go. You want me to go, right? I get out. He went back to the bathroom, retrieved his gun. Sam. Killed her. Sam walked into the bedroom, and as Tarita was waking up and starting to sit up in bed, he shot and killed her. According to Montgomery, Carson got rid of any evidence that linked him to the crime scene. He took his time. When he was satisfied that he had removed any photos, wiped all his fingerprints, he walked from the apartment, got in the car, and left. Investigators asked Montgomery how the crew had discovered the identities of two undercover police officers, Joe Abdallah and Jim Scheider. Montgomery admits that someone from the other side of town recognized them as law enforcement and told Vincent Hill. Oh, there was this girl. Although Hill didn't believe it at first, he soon became suspicious, according to investigator Joe Abdallah. On a subsequent buy we made after that day, they followed us in the truck as we left and followed us back to the FBI building where was our, our meeting spot after the buys took place. And that's the date they quit selling to us. Lissy isn't taking any chances with this witness. He decides to move Montgomery out of state for his own protection. In the fall of 1997, Montgomery pleads guilty to seven murders. As part of the plea agreement, the court seals details of his sentence and whereabouts. I have a warrant for your arrest. Put your hands on your head now. Police arrest Sam Carson and charge him with the murder of Teresa and Tarita Lucas. William Sweeney, already in jail on unrelated charges, is indicted for the triple homicide. With Montgomery safely hidden, law enforcement begins to dismantle the K Street crew's infrastructure. Jerome Martin, Sean Coates, and gang leader Vincent Hill are arrested in the summer of 1998. A federal indictment charges the gang with 13 murders 87 counts of racketeering, drug distribution, kidnappings, and robberies. A federal judge permits recorded testimony from Chrissy Gladden and Robert Butchie Smith to be introduced at trial. Even in death, the gang's victims point a finger at their killers. In 2001, every gang member charged with murder is convicted. They receive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Gang members not accused of murder plead guilty to charges ranging from kidnapping to drug trafficking. There's no doubt in my mind that if these guys stayed on the street, they would have continued doing what they were doing. That was their life. They knew how to sell drugs, how to rob people, how to kill people. Thanks to the tireless efforts of both the FBI and DC Metro Police, K Street is now a safer place to live. <laughs>